Good evening and welcome to the new school. My name is Karen Kooni. I'm the director of the Vera List Center for Art and Politics and delighted to present to you political advertisement number eight tonight by Anthony Montadas and Marshall Rees. Eight in this case refers to eight presidential elections. Eight elections ago in 1984, Ronald Reagan was re-elected the 40th president of the United States and Anthony Montadas and Marshall Rees got to work. They began what is at this point a record-breaking 29-year-long collaboration on a study of electoral politics in this country, narrated through the language of television advertisements by the political candidates themselves, the past five uh, presidents of this country. By the time the eighth edition of political advertisement came around, President Obama's recent re-election um, this past fall, Montadas and Rees had also reached the most expensive election in history with over $2 billion spent on advertisement and, for instance, um, over 80,000 uh, television ads showered on a city like Las Vegas alone. For each election, the compilation of advertisements gets re-edited, the story retold, as if the artists were ventriloquists and spoke to us through this particular dummy or prosthesis, the advertisement machine of our democracy. Hurricane Sandy, and by extension global warming, prevented us from presenting the program as initially scheduled just before the election, we've come to the conclusion that it's just as important um, and perhaps even more meaningful to present this program now, just after the inauguration of um, Obama, to reflect on the last campaign and to look ahead of uh, what is coming uh, our way. I'm very grateful to Anthony and Marshall that they've made themselves available again, and I particularly appreciate Carol Wilder's presence tonight, um, several days before the semester here begins at the new school. Before the three of them introduce the project, let me introduce them. Born in Barcelona, Anthony Montadas on the very left, has lived and worked in New York since 1971. His work addresses social, political, and communications issues, the relationship between public and private spaces within social frameworks, and the investigation of channels of information and the ways in which they may be used to censor or generate ideas. Montadas is currently professor of the practice um, at the ACT and the Department of Architecture at MIT. Marshall Rees, in the center at the table there, is a media artist and a part of the collaborative, the collaborative team Ligorano Rees. For the last 20 years, he and Nora Ligorano's work has combined and dissected media and manipulated images from print, television, the internet, and radio. Ligorano Rees also work in three dimensions and create sculptures and installations that interpret and examine older forms of technology using objects that supposedly signify truth or authority or manifest cultural historicity. Carol Wilder is professor of media studies and film at the New School. She has published articles on communication theory and political communication in numerous journals and has contributed to many books, including such titles as The Dream of Reality, Political Culture and Public Opinion, Media USA, The Dark Side of Interpersonal Communication, Women in Communication, and The Postmodern Presence, and many other books. She was a senior editor of and contributor to Rigor and Imagination, Essays from the Legacy of Gregory Bateson, which received the National Communications Association's Golden Anniversary Book Award. She is also a filmmaker and has um, published a six DVD set, uh, Multiple Visions of the World, from the proceedings of the Centennial Conference on Gregory Bateson. She was a uh, Fulbright Scholar at Hanoi University in Vietnam, where she established a media lab and library and spoke at universities around the country. And her book, uh, Crossing the Street in Hanoi, Teaching and Learning About Vietnam, is forthcoming in a few months um, from the University of Chicago Press. So um, without further ado, thank you very much for coming and thank you all three for being here. Thank you, Carol. And 
It will be a very short uh, introduction because the program is long. It's one hour, 20 minutes. And I'd like to use the opportunity for the introduction to dedicate the session to Ed Diamond. Actually, Ed Diamond, professor uh, of uh, political science at MIT, uh, he was the instigator of this project in 84. Actually, start the conversations in 82, and through two or three years, we decided to start this project. Uh, Ed Diamond uh, wrote the book Spots, Political Advertisement, and he was addressing the issues of the spots from the critical and analytical way, one uh, on text, and for us it was important to see the image, the production of image, in a way that politics and, and advertisement it was linked for what is being used the political advertisement. Like that through the years, another factor, economy, start to be an important element on this production of the image, but in a way it was a, a kind of uh, looking the history of, uh, of that period and see how American presidents that are built in a way that it could be represent a kind of gallery of presidents than in a way of how it's been represented by the media. Like that, in 84, we do the first presentation, and this day, eight. every four years, we meet for uh, Marshall and I to edit, and this is the eighth uh, edit. And Marshall, you want to maybe? So it's, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight and to uh, finally show the tape in New York, uh, as sand, uh, post Sandy. Um, it's, this work has been a, a, a pleasure to work on for 28 years. And uh, what I like about it is um, that it's a, a way of using pr uh, primary source material. Sometimes I allow myself into thinking that it's a, a history, when in point of fact it's sort of a fictionalized history in that the candidates themselves, and the way, as Antoni said, that they portray themselves, are actually building uh, their own fiction of what has transpired. So uh, it's easy to lull, I find myself, it's easy to lull myself into thinking that it's a story where it's actually a representation of history. Um, and I'm very happy that, uh, to, to be here with Carol Wilder, who's a professor here, and I'm gonna turn it over to her. Okay, uh, thank you, it's great to be here. Uh, I haven't been in this auditorium for, for a while. It used to be like my second home. Uh, you can, you've, you've gotten copies of this publication, and I gotta say, a lot more of this was in my brain a couple of months ago when we were gonna be doing this than it is tonight. But so you can read what I, what I wrote uh, about uh, thoughts about the presidential election just in last fall. And I think there were, there were two points. One was, um, it's called the great media bailout. I mean, if, if nothing else, it was you know good for small media markets, television in particular, because the uh, advertising budget was so huge. We don't exactly know somewhere between two and three and four uh, million dollars, but uh, a lot, a lot of money, uh, which seems to drive everything these days. And the second point I make is to draw your attention to uh, Joe McGinnis's 1968 book, The Selling of the President which really uh, is just as interesting and fresh and readable today as it was then. And in particular, uh, because of the way he addresses the, the transformational nature of, of the media and that campaign and some of these ads, uh, the Nixon ads in particular, that are in this uh, reel uh, are Roger Ailes, you know, the dark genius then and now, uh, really sort of pivotal time in, in um, persuasion, in the arts of, the dark arts of persuasion. The, uh, another point that I make, if I may read myself, um, and perhaps this is as good a time as any to mention the incredibly narrow bandwidth of American political discourse and debate. It's as if we had 26 letters of the alphabet to choose from in our conversation and somehow cannot get beyond D for distracted, disgusted, and demoralized. So I'll take that opportunity to, to segue for, for one minute into if I were writing this for the, 
this recent campaign, I just was sort of brainstorming ideas, and my instead of the great media bailout, it would be Metas and Memes in the Hall of Mirrors. Okay, that's the first title. I mean, you, you got to work on that, right? I think in this campaign, the ratio of actual political discourse, like by a candidate talking or by people to, to the meta of the discourse, pundits, satirists, YouTubes, tweets, and so forth, was extraordinary. I mean, it was a million to one. It was infinity to one, you know. Um, and I think that that was a real hallmark of this campaign, that there was so much more discourse about than by of different kinds. Um, that's the meta. And the memes, I mean, of course, this speaks to the distribution network of social media. And I was, I was racking my brain to remember what they were, except, of course, they're a website, so you just got to, you know, Google it. The 47%, the binders of women, uh, Clint Eastwood's chair, Big Bird being fired, the rape guys, laughing Biden, you didn't build that, uh, the Ryan hunky shot. Amnesia, no horses or bayonets, etch a sketch, um, Obama's first debate. You know, I mean, these were the things that people paid attention to in that campaign and that got the most sort of play. As Henry Jenkins' new book calls this, spreadable media. I'm not quite sure what that means yet, um, but uh, I'm going to find out. So that's my that's my take on the most recent one, Metas and Memes in the Hall of Mirrors. They were coming far, farther and farther away from any, I think, substantive uh, political discourse and more and more into the Baudrillardian kind of um, hyper-reality of it. And I'm not sure that's bad. I mean, you know, I like Jon Stewart too, and I think he does a good job. So we're just coming into a different kind of universe of discourse now and being catapulted by this last campaign in social media. And I think that's about what I'll say about that now, and we'll be happy to take your questions later. Okay. All right. So uh, let, let's roll tape. Eisenhower answers America. Food prices, clothing prices, income taxes, won't they ever go down? Not with an $85 billion budget eating away on your grocery bill, your clothing, your food, your income. Yet the Democrats say, you never had it so good. For president who's seasoned through and through, but not so doggone seasoned that he won't try something new. A man who's old enough to know and young enough to do. Well, it's up to you. It's up to you. It's strictly up to you. Do you like a man who answers straight? A man who's always fair? We'll measure him against the others, and when you compare, you cast your vote for Kennedy, and the change that's overdue. So it's up to you. Johnson on November 3rd. 
The stakes are too high for you to stay home. These are critical times. Who do you want to be the next president? Hubert Humphrey offers the best choice for the American people today. If Humphrey can do two things, if he can uh, end the Vietnam War and if he can settle our urban uh, problems, uh, I'd be a very happy man. Well, I think he very definitely has his own personal ideas. This is a very strong man. I would uh, trust his judgment on any issues that might come up. Mr. Humphrey, in our opinion, is a man we can trust and one who will unify the country. He has the initiative and the ingenuity and the administrative ability to run the country in these critical times. The important thing is to get a man that the people in this country will follow. I believe Mr. Humphrey and I can trust him because he has the power to bring us together again. People believe in Humphrey. The country needs him. Does a president know that planes bomb children? When it came to inflation, his attitude was, I'll keep my fingers crossed. Today we have 20% inflation. On housing, interest rates, even foreign affairs, his attitude was, I'll keep my fingers crossed. This man's attitude is fight until the job is done. His colleagues have named him one of our most effective senators. We have a choice. We can choose a man who will do the job, or we can keep our fingers crossed. Take a stand. Kennedy for president. Born poor in Dust Bowl, Kansas, Bob Dole worked hard to succeed. He won two bronze stars for heroism. Wounded, his recovery took three years. He won some and he lost some, but Bob Dole didn't quit. Dole turned Ronald Reagan's vision into an action plan for America. Tax cuts, aid for the Contras, fighting wasteful spending. A strong man with a record of solving tough problems. Bob Dole for president. Bush and Dukakis on crime. Bush supports the death penalty for first-degree murderers. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Despite a life sentence, Horton received 10 weekend passes from prison. Horton fled, kidnapped a young couple, stabbing the man and repeatedly raping his girlfriend. Weekend prison passes. Dukakis on crime. These three Democrats are all saying the same thing. More tax cuts for the rich and big business. Create wealth at the top, they say, and it will trickle down to us. In 10 years, haven't we learned? They never, never let it trickle down. Only Tom Harkin will stop tax giveaways to the rich and do what Roosevelt, Truman, and Kennedy did. Invest in our people, rebuild this nation from the ground up, and put Americans back to work. Paid for by Americans for Harkin. Tom Harkin is attacking Bob Kerry, but he's wrong on the facts. Kerry's not for tax breaks for the rich at all. He's for a targeted investment tax credit that will stimulate the economy, create jobs, and help end the recession. In fact, Bob Kerry will raise taxes on the rich in order to give the middle class a tax cut. A middle class tax cut that Tom Harkin is against. Tom Harkin, old style Democrat, old style negative campaign. Bob Kerry, a winner for a change. Paid for by Kerry for president. In the last three years, 
The Bush administration has invested our tax dollars in pornographic and blasphemous art, too shocking to show. This so-called art has glorified homosexuality, exploited children, and perverted the image of Jesus Christ. Even after good people protested, Bush continued to fund this kind of art. Send Bush a message. We need a leader who will fight for what we believe in. Vote Pat Buchanan for president. 30 years ago, the biggest threat to her was nuclear war. Today, the threat is drugs. Teenage drug use has doubled in the last four years. What's been done? Clinton cut the Office of National Drug Control Policy by 83%. And his own Surgeon General even considered legalizing drugs. Bill Clinton said he'd lead the war on drugs and change America. All he did was change his mind. America deserves better. China has stolen our military secrets and meddled in our elections. They've moved to take control of the Panama Canal, and they're building long-range missiles aimed at the U.S. I'm Gary Bauer. Sadly, Bill Clinton and even some of my Republican opponents have put foreign trade ahead of our national security. As president, I'll end business as usual with China, and if necessary, reopen our military bases in Panama to protect our interests. Please vote for me in the primary February 1st. If you have any question about what John Kerry's made up, just spend three minutes with the men who served with him 30 years ago. I served with John Kerry. I served with John Kerry. John Kerry has not been honest about what happened in Vietnam. He is lying about his record. I know John Kerry is lying about his first Purple Heart because I treated him for that injury. John Kerry lied to his bronze star. I know. I was there. I saw what happened. His account of what happened and what actually happened are the difference between night and day. John Kerry has not been honest. And he lacks the capacity to lead. When the chips were down, you could not count on John Kerry. John Kerry is no war hero. He betrayed all his shipmates. He lied before the Senate. And John Kerry betrayed the men and women he served with in Vietnam. He dishonored his country. He most certainly did. I served with John Kerry. John Kerry cannot be trusted. Swift Boat Veterans for Truth is responsible for the content of this advertisement. I've been blessed for the last 30 years to be married to the most optimistic person that I've ever met. But at the same time, he has an unbelievable toughness, particularly about other people, and that is his ability to fight for them. You're not going to outsmart him. He works harder than any human being that I know, always has. It's unbelievably important that in our president we have someone who can stare the worst in the face and not blink. I'm John Edwards and I approve this message. He's the biggest celebrity in the world. But is he ready to lead? With gas prices soaring, Barack Obama says no to offshore drilling and says he'll raise taxes on electricity? Higher taxes, more foreign oil. That's the real Obama. I'm John McCain, and I approve this message. A great country requires a better direction. A renewed nation needs a new president. The president of the United States of America. The United States of America really is the last great hope of mankind. It's time to get America working again. We don't need a president who apologizes for America. I believe in America. I believe in her purpose and her promise. I believe her best days have not yet been lived. I believe her greatest deeds are reserved for the generations to come. And with the help and the courage of the American people, we will get our country working again. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America.
Mark Block here. Since January, I've had the privilege of being the Chief of Staff to Herman Cain and the Chief Operating Officer of the Friends of Herman Cain. Tomorrow is one day closer to the White House. I really believe that Herman Cain will put United back in the United States of America. And if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't be here. We've run a campaign like nobody's ever seen. But then, America's never seen a candidate like Herman Cain. We need you to get involved because together we can do this. We can take this country back.为什么强大的国家都会走向灭亡呢？古希腊、罗马帝、不列颠帝国、美国，因为他们都犯同样的错误，原来使得他们成功的原则被盗而死。美国政府企图以庞大的开支和税收来摆脱严重的经济衰退
Hi, Marshall. Hi, uh, Ted. Um, it seems that the, that the elections are pretty much predominated by the amount of money that's thrown into them. And uh, with the, the seemingly inevitable result is that the one who gets the most money wins the election. So the obvious answer would be to get the money out of the campaigns, right? Now, I defy anybody to find a legislator who is a beneficiary of this system to undertake an initiative to get the money out of the campaigns in, because he'd just be legislating himself out of a job. Anybody got anything to say about that? Uh, let me just repeat what I said before and or puncture or underline, underscore what I said before. I, I think it, it has to do with our educational system. We have to give responsibility to the audience. You know, audiences have to be more discerning. We have to be more discerning as media consumers. We have to care whether it's truth or truthiness or facts or factoids. Uh, you know, I can't just say, oh, those bad guys up there, they're using every trick in the book. They always have. They always will. Uh, somehow, uh, and maybe we have a generation now that is more savvy in terms of this whole satire generation, the meta generation. Maybe they are more savvy in terms of media literacy, but I don't really see that. So I think it works both ways. It's another, another symptom I think is interesting to consider than I think the effects of the statistics and, and polls before election. Before election, it was clearly near clear than uh, Romney and Obama it was equal and maybe some places and then you see the result and that's very dangerous because the pools it could give them an opinion to in the wrong way because nobody wants to be a loser this especially this is a country of winners and to associate it to a lose and that is very much addressed by the, the statistics and the, and the polls. And the well, but year. that's where Nate Silver became the, you know, the hero of this last election because he interpreted the polling different by doing polls of polls and, and, and uh, predicting, you know, it was 93% that Obama was going to be elected just by interpreting the numbers in a different kind of way. I think just to, to pick up on two things that you said, and we're not really answering Ted's question about clean money, but uh, the, the poll, you know, the, uh, the, the fact that the polls are so prevalent in um, our political discourse is that there's the elections, uh, electoral politics is ongoing. It's, there's never a break. There's, it's, it's, it's always a, a virtual election. And I think that what the, this type of, um, advertising has done is it's really objectified uh, citizenship so that what it's done is it's taken any sort of agency away from citizens mm. so that if you know we're thought of as in, in objective terms or, or uh, as a you know um, uh, uh, adjectival Americans or adjectives there's no subject anymore and so that uh, really it, it, it takes power, takes the ability or the interests of people wanting to participate away from, from politics. And I think that's the real danger of uh, this type of advertising. Hi. Um, I'm interested to hear about, is this working? To hear about your choices of the ads. There's obviously a lot of campaign ads. And when you made this, just interested in your agenda yes. and how you chose the ads that you chose well obviously this work is about editing it's about choices and edit and i think we are totally responsible for that obviously certain elements of subjectivity but uh, it was the intention of the project it was to see how the image uh, from advertising perspective and politics has been changing if it's changed and I think this he was trying to emphasize with the choices of the ads that I think we needed to see hundreds of ads, and this is a selection. Like that is clearly that this selection is based on image values 
And I think also the paradoxes and maybe contradictions of the politics. No? Uh, you agree? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, you know, we also look at things different. I mean, I think that what impressed me at first, you know, we've been working on this for almost three decades. And um, it, it said you, it's really the history of television, but it's not just the history of television, it's the history of techniques, of, of type of narratives, um, as, you know, uh, like in 19, just thinking, seeing it tonight, like 1968, there's a, a street interviews that had, you know, candidates first in the early 60s were addressing the camera, then there are like fictional characters uh, addressing it. So this is all the type of development of, of television, of like the technologies in television, the use of graphics, and that's also part of the story that we're, we're telling. It's not just the history of the United States, not just the political discourse, but it's these other types of, um, uh, of styles that, that are really communicating the message. Okay, I had a question, they gave me the mic, so. All right, um, so we're, we're here, we're watching these uh, advertisements and we're looking at them like from a critical standpoint. So I guess like we're, we're in the minority being that we're just here watching these. <laughs> I had, but I guess my question, more of a question and statement is that given the fact that we're watching these advertisements and a lot of us are, are laughing at, you know, the absurdity of many of them, doesn't it speak to uh, lack of effort or or even competence on behalf of the American people that rely on these ads to determine who they vote for? Uh, that's well said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, it's about the audience taking some responsibility. You know, and, and, and if we have this participatory media culture now, well, let's make it participatory. And, 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 and these, these kind of one-way uh, messages, they're supposed to have that kind of effect, but uh, in some cases they do. I mean, I just, you know, like, I think one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, there is a d divide between uh, the media that people have and the media that people don't have. So that as you look at this, you also have to think like in the 50s that a certain percentage of households had televisions. They were people who had the incomes that could afford televisions and it's the same with the internet. And, and so you can see how the uh, wide, how technology became more widespread and the messaging became more uh, bro uh, broadcast uh, to people. Um, in many countries, political um, television ads are illegal. And in this country, it's what makes the campaign so expensive. And I really don't think politicians like it. I mean, politicians in Congress have to spend all their time fundraising. So is there any chance we could ever make them illegal in this country? <laughs> uh, Carol, that's your, your question. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Oh, oh, I mean, what a question. I was just thinking about how the Republicans have gerrymandered the congressional districts and red states, and now they're trying to change the election, even though there are 1.1 more million people voting for Democrats in the House, the Republicans can control it because of the way that the districts are gerrymandering. And I know that doesn't sound like it relates to your question, but it, to me it relates to the way decisions are made in the political culture. I mean, if things are going on at kind of that level, if we can't get assault rifles sort of managed in some way, uh, I, I, how can we ban, how, I mean, how, how can we, what do you think? What do I think? <laughs> Say something. <laughs> Say something. Well, no, I mean, I think Carol brings up some, uh, an interesting point, the, the way that, uh, that the uh, voting districts are, uh, are, the boundaries for voting districts are arrived at. And I think that, you know, it's very hard to run uh, against an incumbent. And so that the, you know, politicians make sure that, that they're incumbents. And, it, I don't know, Montadas and I are artists, so that we're pr presenting this as a way to think about our political system. But we, I don't, I, w I, don't, I don't want to speak for Montadas, but I don't think I have many answers to how we can solve it. I can just show, I, I can look at it and, and come up with some themes and some, some aspects about it 
for you to think about, but I can't, I don't have any solutions at this, uh, maybe, maybe in a few months. Well, I think it, it functions as a mirror. It's a kind of mirror of how society is organized in a certain way. And I will say that every work is should speak by themselves. I think whatever is uh, come up from this work, I think we are totally, as I said before, responsible. And I think it's kind of individual opinions, but I think it's a strong way how to, to see the evolution of this image uh, are so connected uh, with economics. Uh, the value, and I think you pointed out in your article, of, uh, of how much they was spending 2007 uh, from 2.6 billion to 2010, 4 billion, and only this 60% is, uh, is television. But that this is a kind of uh, uh, numbers that I think, in a way, explain then how much politics are defined by economics. Can I say something about your editing? I sort of mentioned this in my little piece, but it's, uh, it makes me think of uh, Quintilian, the Roman rhetorician, who said that the secret of art is to conceal art. And the editing of this, the reel, uh, although I would probably make it shorter, but my daughter says I want everything to be shorter. So uh, it is, is seamless, and it's, it's so, it's so, uh, so so sophisticated or so savvy that you don't even notice it. I mean, that's what good editing is about, right? That you don't notice it. And I really thank you for not doing any trick stuff, you know, for really kind of, although the choices and the juxtapositions and the progression is all so artful. So that's the secret of art being to conceal art. I, I really give you credit for that because there's a huge amount of thought that goes into that. Uh, thank you. We, we, yeah, we do spend a we we do spend a lot of time doing that, and it doesn't show, which is perfect. Uh, I would I would agree that um, the seamlessness seamlessness you refer to, Carol, is um, it's also evident in the content. I mean, I was impressed having seen this program before, how the economics speak throughout in a really unified way mm -hmm. from 1952 to to the present. But I. I also wonder if, in some ways, it seems like it must be fascinating to have seen the complexity of the context change so completely while you're doing this, and that now how can you distinguish between these ads and being on Jimmy Kimmel or David, David Letterman? I mean, the whole idea of advertising in an attention economy has changed completely. And Carol, when you say that, education is the key to changing the American electorate. That's also the smartest thing in the world and the most oversimplified thing in the world to say. I mean, in some ways, it's like peeling the layers of an onion. And, and it's interesting to me that nobody mentioned the two-party system tonight because that's just something you don't talk about. Um, and I wonder how, how do we get people and students to, to be able to enrich that context for themselves I mean, if you were having this conversation with an entirely different group of people, um, demographically, you'd probably have an entirely different conversation. And that, too, would be interesting. And the complexities just lead to more complexities, it seems to me. Well, you, you have shown this all over. Uh, so maybe you could comment a little bit about the reactions of your other audiences. Uh, you showed it in Europe and um, Florida, right? Right. Uh, well, we didn't see the screenings in Europe because we were here. Uh, you know what? What inter I think that the, the, that the uh, reactions to the audiences are in many ways very similar. I mean, you know, there. The, I think that you can look at it with a certain. You can look at this material with a certain distance and appreciate it uh, uh, as but, material. But I think it's important to consider that this work is addressed to. United States audience. I think it's so much information here than 
and even some politicians that nobody knows in Europe or in Latin America and Asia. I mean, all the primaries people. I mean, where they are these people? Who knows in Europe about? I think in a, in a way, a lot of this, uh, what is going on is about here. I mean, like that. I think this is the, the privileged audience. I think it's, it's about United States. And I think the, the view that Europe could have is sometimes anecdotal. Mm -hmm. Well, we actually, we, we, have seen, I've, uh, we have seen it in Europe, Montadas in France and me in Spain. Uh, and I think that, you know, there is a language difference. I mean, this, is a, this type of advertising is very culturally to the United States. I mean, it comes out of advertising, it comes out of broadcast television, and, and those are things that are very American. Okay. What happened? Uh, we're, over, we're, over, the, we're over. We're over. The, the, the building is closed. Ah, okay. So that we'll, we'll just watch this for 24 it's like hours. Another, <laughs> another Sandy. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Sarah. Thank you.